ministry. Um, I leave this, this thing that's going on up here. <laughs> um, and I just want to say I'm glad you're here. Um, if you want to stand up, we're going to open up with a word of prayer. Father God, we are a thankful people. Um, God, we thank, thank you for the, the, the reminders around us all the time of your greatness. Um, even when we see the, the, the snowfall, help it um, remind us um, that you create beautiful things. Um, and there are beautiful things that you have in store for our lives. Um, if we will just turn them over to you, God, help us to be a people of sacrifice. Um, that we give of ourselves, we give of our time and our finance and um, all of our gifts and our abilities and our talents um, to serve your name, um, to make an impact in, in our community and to love our neighbors. God, we love you so much and we thank you for Son Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
1 John 1, 5 through 7 says, This is the message we have heard from high and declare to you, God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. 
and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin.
cross as a way for the power to the world of the treasures we found. You may be seated. I love that song. It's been kind of a crazy morning. But it's communion time. Are you ready? Okay. I'm ready. Maybe. Here we go. John chapter 19. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. That's three Marys. And when Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, that would be John, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son, meaning John. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour on, that disciple took her to his own home. And I've read that many times, but the other day I was reading this and uh, I had this weird thought popped into my head, which isn't really unusual, but I thought, wow, that small group of followers. What was it like for them the first time the church got together, as recorded in Acts, and they they had communion? You know, when maybe one of the apostles or disciples they broke the bread and they handed it to Mary. This is this is his body that was broken for you, or they took the cup and they gave it to them and said, "This is his blood that was shed for you." And I thought, my God, I, I don't know. The memories that that would have evoked, the, the horror of that day, you know, as they stood there and they watched Jesus, their friend, in Mary's case, her son, the Messiah, the one they thought was going to be king, nailed to a cross, bloody and beaten, struggling for every breath, and they watched him die in front of their eyes. And I thought, Lord, I, I don't know that I could have taken communion. How could they do that? It would have just been too much. And almost immediately the thought came, well, yeah, but they'd seen the risen Lord. Jesus puts it like this. He's talking to the disciples right before he goes to the cross. He says, uh, Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come, but as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take away from you. And I thought, yeah, that's right. They'd seen the risen Lord. They saw Him die on a cross. They saw Him once He rose from the dead. They knew he had ascended into heaven, that he sat at the right hand of God, and that one day he was coming back again. And now, over 2,000 years later, here we are, this group of, of believers, gathered together here in St. Joe on a continent that those early Christians didn't even know about. And we have the same privilege, the same honor um, to partake of the Lord's Supper. And when we do, we proclaim to each other and to the world that Jesus died for our sin, that He rose from the dead, that He's sitting at the right hand of God, and that one day He's coming back. Wouldn't it be cool if that was now, during communion? <laughs> Could happen, you know. Are you ready? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, you're so good. 
Um, we owe a debt to Jesus that we could never repay. Your love is just uh, unbelievable. So thank you for this time. I pray that it honors you and your son Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. Wow. So, um, you can see the polar plunge is gaining momentum, and this morning it has been changed twice. So, Cohen, you are going in too. Um, you can see it is Vaughn, Osric, me, Aaron, Mickey, and Cohen. That means we are just over halfway to getting Dustin. Yeah. Junior church, four years old through fourth grade, you are dismissed to walk. No. So, um, this whole year we've been looking at the, so far this year, we've been looking at the Old Testament, and we've been finding that Jesus is there, not just at creation. Then we looked at, um, because at creation it was everything was created in him, through him, and he holds all things together. Last week, we looked at the law, the first five books of the Old Testament. And in those regulations of life that God gave us, we once again see not just the need for Jesus, but the Messiah himself. The perfection that God deserves cannot be achieved on our own. We cannot be good enough to come to God, which is why God designed a plan, a path. And that plan is Jesus. Since we cannot overcome evil, we need him. Um, in our lives to show and fulfill the whole law. The Old Testament is full of a lot of things. I, I was raised in a church, and, and one, one guy said, all we need is the New Testament. We're a New Testament church. And that didn't really sit well with me. I didn't understand why until I got to Bible college and found out that's very bad theology. We don't just need the Old te uh, New Testament. We need the Old Testament. Um, the Old Testament is divided into a few sections. You can see up here on this picture. You can see the first five books, which we looked at last week. The Torah, the Law, the Pentateuch. Um, next are the books of history. Last year, when we went through the, the life of David, we went through a lot of those or hit some of those. Next is a lot of the guys' favorite. There is poetry. I know how you guys just love to read poetry. That was a joke, yeah. Apparently not a good one. And then you got the major and minor prophets. Now, do you know the difference between major and minor? Do you know what makes a major prophet or a minor prophet? The length of the book. That's it. Okay? So, really, it has nothing to do with their message. It has nothing to do with who they are in the time period. It's how long of a book or letter they wrote. Okay? That's the difference. Okay? Um... In this, in this whole thing, we can find Jesus in every section. You're going to find Jesus in almost every single book. There's a few books that don't really mention Messiah, but they always allude to the Messiah. They always have this um, essence of pointing forward to him. And so while he may not be described uh, fully, he is always alluded to in everything. And when we come to the prophets, 
Um, there's a very important thing with that. Um, at first, when we were re- getting ready to look at this foundations of faith, of looking through Jesus, and I, I wanted to go through the Old Testament, because we can't just go, we're not just a New Testament only church. I wanted to look at it. And after looking at it, I was left with the thought that if we really do this the way I wanted to, we will not get to the Gospels, the New Testament, until at least September. If we were going to look at all the times Jesus was mentioned in a summary version. That's how often he, he's mentioned in there. Um, While I only read a few of the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, I want to challenge you to look through the Old Testament and actually look for the signs of Jesus, for His work, His words, His ministry, because He is there. As we saw the first week, He is working before creation, in creation, and since creation. Uh, Last week we saw Jesus in the law. Today we're going to look at just a couple prophecies, and one is the major, most famous one in Isaiah 53. Before we do that, though, what is prophecy? Let's get a basic of that. What is prophecy? It is the foretelling or prediction of what is to come that is inspired by God. It's not a guess. One year, when we were in, in um, Kentucky uh, ministering there, there was a team. That was, this was a pretty good team at the time. Um, Tony Dungy was the, the coach of the football team, the Colts. And um, that year... I, from the pulpit, because they were going to play in the Super Bowl that Sunday, I said the Colts are going to win. It's a prediction. All of you guys who are rooting against them are wrong and going to go to hell because the Colts are winning. And guess what? I was right about just the Colts winning. It was a guess, not a prediction. And there's a big difference between a guess and prophecy. Prophecy is an assured message by God that is going to happen. The Bible defines a prophet as prophet as an ordinary person who reveals information from God that on man-made knowledge cannot be known. We're going to look at just a few key, but I want you to know there are almost 400 Old Testament prophecies just about Jesus. Not just about the temple or um, enslavement, destruction, just about Jesus. In the Old Testament, there are almost 400. That's a lot of prophecies, isn't it? The first one we're going to look at is the one we've hit three weeks in a row now. Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15. So the Lord God said to the serpents, Because you have done this, cursed are you about all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is the absolute first prophecy about Jesus. After we read of Satan's um, first deception, he confuses and misleads and ultimately greatly harms the first man and first woman. And this is what led to the chaos of sin entering into the world at the Garden of Eden, and, and ultimately that chaos of the world invaded and comes into all of our hearts and in our lives. It's a very powerful powerful narrative, a true story of what happened at the human race against God's original blessing of creation. And yet, even though right here we read that humans are going to suffer, you're going to suffer, all of us are going to suffer because of sin through the millennia, we also see right there God has a plan of redemption. He speaks of the woman Eve, the mother of all human life, the matriarch of humankind, and to her... She is representing all of humanity, all of womankind here. He says, your offspring. There is going to be one here, and that is going to be a battle with Satan. There is an offspring. Not going to be your firstborn. Not your secondborn. But somewhere along the line, I have planned that one is coming. He is going to be born of woman, and he is going to battle Satan. The result of this battle, and it notice it says he, so that means we know the offspring is going to be male. He is going to be struck in the heel by Satan. How many of you ever had a foot injury? Yeah, those are fun, aren't they? Well, now we get those little carts, and you get to ride around and push people out of the way in Walmart and stuff, and 
And, and we have those things. But back then, you had a heel injury. You couldn't do your work. You couldn't do as much. They didn't have AFLAC to, to pay for your bills. And so it was a lot more detrimental. But a heel injury, a foot injury, you can overcome. Even if it's so much so that you get a limp, you can still overcome it and not let it cause your life to stop. That's a big difference than what this offspring is going to do to Satan. And this is really critical. It's not an off, um, offspring of Satan. It is Satan himself who is going to cause this little strike on the heel, and yet his head is going to be crushed. How many of you ever had a crushing blow to your head? You know, okay, I was going to say, I don't believe anybody who raised their hand, but Vaughn did, so uh, maybe <laughs> I might believe that one. Yeah. You don't live from a crushing blow to the head. A crushing blow to the head means death. And the offspring here is going to have this male person is going to come and have victory over Satan. A victory that is because of the sin chaos and as a result of deceiving all mankind. This prophecy shows us that Jesus will destroy the work of the enemy of our souls. This is really key. You need to know Jesus crushes the work that Satan wants to do against you. You know what that really tells me? All these sins, all these consequences of my sins and people's sins around me do not hold power over me. Because Satan is crushed. Jesus overcame that. This is a very early hint of God's plan of salvation on the cross. The first prophecy. Let's look at one in Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will rest on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I love this passage. It really starts... Um, this prophetic vision of what the Messiah is going to be in the book of Isaiah. And what it says plainly is, there is going to be a child. Well, we already, we already know that in Genesis 3. It's going to be a son. Again, we see that. It's re repeating that. He's going to have great authority and power. This son is going to have many times. And, and real quick, just look at this. So in Genesis 3, God says, Satan, you're going to die, and here is my plan. Sometime in the timeline, there's going to be a person who's going to come and he's going to crush your head. And so here's the timeline, Satan. You have this much time. Now we get down to Isaiah and he pulls it in a little closer. Just in case you didn't know, Satan, let me, let me just narrow the focus just a little bit more. And this son is going to have many titles. Then they reflect the very nature of the Trinity, the triune God. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This prophecy tells us that Jesus is going to be God Himself. He's not just some ordained prophet. He's not some just good religious teacher or a great person. He is God Himself who is coming. Just in case you didn't realize that, Satan, I'm coming back for you. Here's the timeline. Let me just narrow it down a little. In Colossians, when we go into the New Testament, verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 9. For in Christ lives the fullness of God in human body. You don't believe that Jesus is God himself? Well, New Testament and Old Testament agree that he is. Later on in the book of Isaiah, there is another description of the Messiah to come. 53, verse 2. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in the dry ground. There's nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. This does not describe me. Some of you are paying attention. Okay, this speaks here of this coming Messiah, and there's nothing very flashy about him. Starts as his infancy and childhood, the tenderness of youth. He grew as one of us. He grew without status and lowly condition. 
and in a way that is not agreeable with those ideas that we would think as the Messiah. Right there. Hey, we're going to narrow it down. He's not going to be coming as a king. He's going to come as a nobody. People thought that when the Messiah came, he should come in with pomp and power and a mighty warrior. This new one should come in and overthrow everybody. And, and God says in Isaiah, no, no, no. When you look at him, you're not even going to say, hey, that's the Messiah. There's going to be nothing physical that pulls you to him because it's not the physical. It's going to be the spiritual that grabs our attention. He was going to have none of the glory which we thought he should have. God, no, none of the beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing like that. This goes against the, the really the standard de- depiction of Jesus. If you see all those pictures with Jesus, you know he's got the lovely, fair skin, light blonde, brownish blonde locks and blue eyes. He looks like he's from Wisconsin. There won't be superficial reasons for noticing him. Let's go to verse 3. He was despised and rejected. Okay, a guy we don't even realize, we don't even notice, he's going to be despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, the Prince of Peace, the mighty warrior, almighty God, is going to be a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. This prophecy is really telling us the Messiah will be a person will be personally familiar with pain and suffering. Go back a few when we just looked at those those titles of him. He would not be spared or think any different. This unique Messiah would receive rejection. This prophecy shows that he's the suffering servant. Not only will he be suffering, but the Messiah, the one prophesied about, will be rejected by his own people. Rejected by those he came to save. He will be despised, loathed enough that people would not, that they would give false testimony in order to incriminate him that he would die. You ever had such loathing feelings towards somebody that you want to go tell the police they're a terrorist and must be hung for their actions now. And that's what God's people did. Not only was the manner of Jesus coming unimpressive to those awaiting a mighty deliverer, he was in the end hated and turned down by those who came to save. He was despised by the Pharisees who looked at uh, the display of his power and his miracles, who heard the wisdom of his teachings, he was so hated that they vowed to kill him. And yet, so did all of us. All of mankind ended up hating him. I can prove that you ended up hating him. How many of you have sinned? And when you sin, you are choosing to hate God. Those are your options. Our Savior knew what it was like to have people turn against Him, to hide their faces, to say, no, I will not follow you. Only, really, back up a minute, Jesus is the only one who knew what it's like to say, oh God, yes, or Jesus, you are God, I'm going to follow you, hail Hosanna, and then a few days later, kill Him. I can't stand Him. That quick and utter betrayal, even by the close one where Peter says, I don't even know the guy, and he uses some cuss words to explain, explain that. No one has suffered pain like Jesus suffered. No one has been rejected and abused, neglected, despised like Jesus. First, let me just say something. Other people were crucified in the same manner as Jesus. I'm not talking about the physical. I'm talking about the spiritual and physical and emotional all rolled into one because no one in the history of mankind has ever been nailed to the cross holding everybody's sins. And that shows the hatred of him. No one has been more rejected, abused, neglected, despised than Jesus was. And it was the whole world who did it, including you and me. Jesus was despised. This scripture says, and you didn't care. I didn't care. Let's go to verse 4. Yet it was our weakness he carried. 
It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. The punishment right here, the Messiah is going to take on were not his, but ours. The penalty of my sin and yours. He will bear it himself. And yet, looking at it, we will consider, what did he do to deserve this? He probably deserved it. He probably did something. Stricken by God, the on the cross, the leader of his people, the very people who put them there, would assume the judgment he had was righteous and from God's own hand. They assumed the judgment was on him for his sins. And scriptures thousands of years before said it's confusing because it's for us. Go to verse 5. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Notice that dichotomy there. While mankind hated Jesus, the Messiah, while you and I chose sin to hate God, He personally took that punishment and held it for our sins. He who had led the only perfect life on this planet would be crushed, destroyed by our sins. Our iniquities, our wicked acts. He did those who thought he was a nobody, who was worthless, who despised him. Why would he do this? Really, think about your life right now. What about you is so good that the Savior, the Messiah, would say, yeah, I'll pay for their punishment. They deserve hell, so I will take that for them. Imagine that. The Creator, the one who created everything, looked at you and said, even though you deserve hell, I will go there for you. I will bear the consequences. I will bear the penalty. Even though you hated me. Even though you despised me. That's an unspeakable gift. By His own choice, When he didn't need to, when he was seated at the right hand of God, he purposely, intentionally came to serve us. Philippians chapter 2, go to the New Testament, 6 and 8. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself to obedience of God to die a criminal's death on the cross. Don't ever forget that even before he came to heal us, before creation, he already decided to come and suffer with us and for us. So we think about the healing that each one of us needs most deeply. We We need to remember that Jesus did not come firstly to put an end to suffering, but rather to fill it, finish it, with His presence. Isaiah 53, verse 6. Go to there. All of us, like sheep, have been led astray. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on Him the sins of us all. Just so you know, it may not be on the screen. All of you have these little devices called phones. You can look it up on there. Or... Or, a physical Bible. It'd be um, Isaiah 53, verse 6, just so you know. Okay? Humans all share a common choice. We have all rejected God. We have walked out of His light and grace. We have done our own thing, asserted our own independence, our desire to be our own God. And because of this, God put on the Messiah, He put on to Jesus all of our sins. The Lamb that would be sacrificed as a sin. We talked about last week in the, the law. All of those sins were going to be pushed onto him, that lamb, for a little bit. Well, this time they're going to be put on him for eternity. They're gone. They're taken away completely. God has laid our sins on the Messiah. The scripture here puts us at the same level. All of us, without exception, have gone off track. We have gone astray. And this prophecy tells us that Jesus pays the penalty of our sins. He pays for it. He doesn't just roll it over for later. He doesn't put it on back order. He didn't even put it on layaway. He paid for it. When we choose to sin, 
When we choose to not live for God, we've turned our own way. But here's the amazing thing. Although it is we, me, that we have gone astray, that I have sinned against God, that I offended Him in my treatment of Him, our treatment of others, I don't have to pay the price. God has taken that away and put that on Jesus. What I earned for my wages, what I earned for my sins, He took away. He was led as that lamb to slaughter. That phrase is no accident, and it can remind us of God's plan all through the Old Testament. And all the way into the New Testament in Revelation when it says the Lamb who was slain from the creation. Isaiah 53, let's go to verse 7. He was oppressed and treated harshly. How many of you have ever been treated harshly, yeah? Yet he never said a word. I don't think we could keep our hand up on that one. He was led like a lamb to slaughter, as a sheep is silent before the shears. He did not open his mouth. If you've ever been offended, how many of you would have said, hey, that's not right? No fair, time out. That's not right. The one who was prophesied about the Messiah would offer no self defense. He would not try to vindicate or justify. He did not serve as his own lawyer, lawyer to reduce his own sentence. Again, he went not to be glorified, but to pay for my penalty. To the cross he was led. Go to verses 8 and 9. Unjustly condemned. This is all in the Old Testament. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants. Also, he was never married, had no kids. Okay, we're seeing more here. That his life was cut short in midstream, so he's going to die young. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people, God says. He had done no wrong, had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. That right there is really weird. He, um, he was buried like a criminal in a rich man's grave. Those two normally can't go together. Yet if you read the New Testament, you can see how they do. So much more could obviously be said here, but we have this prophecy about Jesus written 750 years before he was born in Bethlehem. Let's go on to verse 10. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him, meaning Jesus, cause him grief. Yet when his life was made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He had no earthly descendants, and now he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, even though he was cut short here on earth. And the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. The suffering servant, the Messiah, wrongfully led to death, will have no voice defending him. And here's the thing. That's what God wanted the whole time. It was the will of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, that Jesus would be made an offering for us. And notice how it all turned around. What seems bad turned into something wonderful, not just for Him. It did turn to something wonderful for Jesus. Because He ended up with many descendants. He ended up with glory. He ended up with a throne. But He went through this way so that we could go with Him. And that's the big difference here. Verse 11, when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will be made possible for many to be counted righteous. Because of him, you can be counted righteous, for he will bear their sins. All of this was on Jesus, the penalty of our sins, not his own. The sins of all humanity, they paid for on the cross. But what was the reason? So you and I could be the recipients of grace. So that we can have our sins taken away and instead put his, righteous, his righteousness put on top, uh, on top of us. The love of God will re be revealed in the most powerful way. In him coming to you and saying, you sinner, you hellbound, let me take that away and hold it myself and I'll give you righteousness and purity and co-heir of heaven. The result of knowing the saving work of Christ will be for many, not just a certain tribe, not just those who might be deemed good enough, but many descendants. And that means that God would see us just as we had never sinned. You ever had to walk into someone that you did something wrong? So uh, when I was in uh, sixth grade, I you have to know me back then, I was kind of a 
defiant kid who was really mad at his parents because we moved from Wyoming to Indiana, and I quit doing my homework. Let me tell you, kids, don't do that. That's a dumb thing to do. But I responded by not doing my homework and got an F on one of my assignments. And part of my thing was I had to take it to my mom and have her sign it to prove that I showed her. And so the day I was supposed to turn it in, I wrote my mom's name on it and turned it into my teacher. That day, I got to go down to the principal's office, and he asked me, did your mom sign this? Yes. Well, we just talked to her on the phone. She's approved that you're going to get a spanking. And she says to expect one when you get home. To look at my teacher, who I actually really liked. This teacher, I really liked him. And yet I chose to lie to him. I chose to try and deceive him. And he was the one who actually spanked me. The next day when I went back into class to go sit and look at him. You know what I was feeling? This guy's never going to like me again. He's never going to trust me. He's probably going to ignore me. The God who sees us as sinners takes that sin away and then sees us as pure and innocent. Brubaker actually treated me like I'd never done it. It it was weird. He joked with me that day. Treated me normal. And that's nothing compared to what Jesus does to us, what God does to us. When He looks at you, He doesn't see your sins. He already took care of that. He is the flawless, perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Isaiah 53, verse 12. God says, I will give him the honor of the victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He will be counted among the rebels. Hey, Jesus is a rebel, just so you know. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. These verses are very specific. Notice how I said in in Genesis, God said this, and then he went like this. Now he's starting to pinpoint it even more. That is not just for our benefit. It's also for Satan to say, look, it is coming. Your rule is over. They are pointed like a laser here to fulfill this. Do you know the mathematical probability that one person could fulfill these prophecies just in Isaiah 53? Just the ones found in Isaiah 53. After examining just eight different prophecies, professors at Westminster Collins conservatively estimate the chance of one man fulfilling eight prophecies is 10 to the 17th power. One in 100 quadrillion. Okay, that's a big number. So let's, let's do it this way. Let's say I had a hat, and I put ten pieces of paper in, and I wrote my name on it, stirred them up, and then had Alec come up and blindfoldedly draw one out. What are the chances that he could pull out the one ticket? One in ten. That's right. Okay. So now we have to do ten to the seventeenth power. And here's how they have figured this out. You take that 100 quadrillion and put them in silver dollars. That's a lot of money, right? Okay? Lay them on the face of Texas. They will cover the state of Texas two feet deep. That's not ten pieces of paper. That's two feet deep of silver dollars. And on one of those... There's an X. We're going to take Alec again, put him on a helicopter. He's going to fly over Texas, and when he wants to, he'll tell him to land. And then he'll walk, and when he wants to, he'll reach in and pull one coin out. What are the chances he can pull out the one coin? Not going to happen. That's a one in 100 quadrillion chance. 
just the same as chance that the prophets would have writing these things 750 years earlier and one man would fulfill them, that they would come true. Do you know what that tells me? Jesus is the only one who can fulfill prophecy. He is the only one. We haven't even gotten to the New Testament yet, have we? And we're looking here. Yet, when you look at Isaiah 53, if you would just examine 53, those 12 verses, we looked at 2 through 12, that are written over 700 years before Silent Night ever happened. Because of all this prophecy in the Old Testament, we can see the need for Jesus, the plan for Jesus, the pain of Jesus, the victory of Jesus, the victory for those in Jesus. We cannot ignore the Old Testament because without it we cannot fully understand the New Testament. And here what we see in these 12 verses is a synopsis, a full summary of the full gospel. The Old Testament tells us everything we need to know about Jesus. The New Testament goes into greater detail of why we need Him and what He did for us. We are not a New Testament church. We are a church of Jesus Christ. We are a church that focuses on Him and the whole Scripture He gave us. The whole thing. I don't just need the New Testament. I need all of it. I cannot understand or understand the depth and the power of Jesus in the New Testament without understanding the depravity of mankind, which is described in the Old Testament. And if you are not impacted by this, if this, hearing this, does not hit you, I feel confident to say that you're really not listening. You're not hearing the power and the message of Jesus all through Scripture. You haven't allowed the message of truth to truly penetrate to your soul. If you have, belief, if you have trouble believing that all this could really happen, if you are having trouble believing that all these prophecies really came true, I want to tell you something really good. You're not the only one. You're in great company. Many people have had a hard time with that. Everyone who has wondered at some time of the power of the gospel story, of, of the struggle to imagine and come to terms with it, to understand that I do deserve hell and yet I get to go to heaven. But you're also in the company of those who have struggled with the even more difficult idea behind the gospel that if you are loved so powerful, so extravagantly by God, that to God you are so valuable and that, um, your life matters so much to the creator of the universe that he would do this for you. And you can do nothing in return except accept it. Through these first few sermons, this year we've already learned that God has a purpose for your life. And that it isn't just a scrape by. That you weren't just to exist until you died. That you truly matter. Through these first few sermons, we can see that from in the beginning until the gospel was starting to be written, Jesus was already coming for you. He was already coming to take the pain and death. And God kept laser focusing all of these prophecies to point to the one. It's almost like he said, Satan, I know you're not smart enough. Let me narrow it down a little. That's still not good enough. Let me narrow it down. And around 400 prophecies, he kept narrowing it down. It even says in the Old Testament, we'll be born in Bethlehem. It says all these things. And I can really see God up there saying, right here. He's coming right here. And says, like, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. And the whole time, what are we doing? Looking around. Not even paying attention. And so as much as he could be saying it to Satan, how much more is he saying, look, my people. I planned for this. I designed it because I want you. I want you in eternity. I want you in home with me. Look what everything I've done through all these years, and I laser focused it because it's not just on Jesus, it's on Jesus looking at you. And that's the point of it. It's not Jesus looking at sinners, it is Jesus looking at those he loves. He is looking and wanting you. You feel worthless in this world? You feel discarded and trashed? You feel like you don't matter. 
one who holds all of creation did all of this to look at you. And when he grabs your attention finally, he says, you, my precious child, the one who I did everything for, the supernovas in the sky, the redwood trees, the depths of the ocean were created so that you could see me. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he came for you. And we haven't even got into the Gospels yet. This is going to be a good year. This is going to be a good year. You've never accepted that. You've had troubles with that. Will you let us walk with you in that? I can point to several people in this room right here who would love to sit down and show with you and walk with you and point with you the way Jesus has changed their life to where they are now. Will you choose that today? And for the rest of us, you've already chosen Him. How is your life going to be different? Because this laser focus is there for you. And are you going to let it permeate and penetrate into your heart and your mind so that it can well within you a life that overflows and transforms the rest of the world around you? Because again, I can point to several people who can show you what he's done in their lives. What will you choose to do? Let's stand. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that this isn't based on our own merit because... We don't have enough. God, I want to thank you for, for all the Old Testament, for all of your written word and how they all combine together into one message of you saying you love us this much. And God, I ask that you would continue to open our hearts and our minds to the fullness of your message. Forgive us when we do choose to look away and follow the evil one. Remind us of that penalty that you paid for our sins and remind us of the penalty he has for what he has done also, for what Satan has done. Guide us with your truth as you promised to do. Open our eyes so that we can stand and fulfill it. And God, I ask again that you waken the church, that you rise up people who are willing to be disciples, true followers, that we can build our lives on the foundation of our faith, which is Jesus, your Son. And in His name we pray. Amen.